like, what should happen? I don't really know how to transition. <laughs> but something somehow, so like, mental, <laughs> what's a palate cleanser, like little citrus <laughs> water. <laughs> Although, actually, the learner. Um, so, Rachel is our next reader. Um, and Rachel's introduction is in the voice of Phil, Rachel's cat. <laughs> Perfect. Hello, my name is Bill. I'm Rachel's cat. She's asked me to write her introduction since I do little for her besides momentarily cure her existential malaise and keep her feet warm at night. I like water. I like water in the bathtub. Rachel finds this funny. So does her life partner, Courtney Harrell. You may know her. She is most likely with you right now. Please pick her up and hold her like a baby. Let her know how it feels to be me. Laugh at them both for doing nothing at all. Their laughter haunts my dreams. Water soothes me. I long for the outdoors. My life is a prison. My only escape is climb the arm of the couch so I can get a squirt of water in the face. The sweet relief of a nice spritz. Rachel writes fiction, loves short stories especially, and has recently begun to write essays. I've heard her practice for this evening. You are in store for something mediocre as she did not take my suggested edits. <laughs> Goodbye, forever. <laughs> Rachel Burkett. Wow, so that's like, it's pretty much impossible to follow the community up after that. Um, and I'm feeling pretty nervous because, like, my cat kind of sucks. <laughs> that would be a better introduction. Um, so I'm going to read the start of a new piece that I'm still trying to figure out. The frame story is a bit shoddy, so I'm skipping a little bit. But um, all you really need to know is that the you that the narrator references is her daughter. That's all you really need to know. And the tentative title of the piece is Right, like R-I-T-E-S, which you won't totally understand why that is, um, where I leave you off but hopefully there will be enough suspense that you want to know the rest is about, and you can ask me, because there's a pretty sexy scene later on. <laughs> Which I wish I had the time to read, but I felt like it would have been weird out of context. <laughs> so, okay. Um, what I remember most is the blood red lining on the train car seats and the depth of the darkness outside as we pulled to a stop. We arrived in Budapest from Prague a little after 11 p.m the only ones left on board. Your father and I walked the dark streets and he led us to the hostel's office with only a map in his hand, stopping occasionally beneath the street lamps to check that we were on course. This was before we could afford those kinds of phones. It was too expensive, so we relied only on internet in cafes and at the places we were staying, writing directions in our journals and on the backs of receipts. As we walked the dark streets, I was surprised by how deserted they were. It was as if the whole city had gone to sleep, but when I think of it now, it very well could have been a Sunday. I remember little of how we finally got to the hostel we were renting for the next several days, only that it was cheap and a far walk from the owner's offices. Inside, there was a bench made from an old clawfoot bathtub split in half, and our bed took up the entirety of a small room off of the kitchen, so that when you opened the door, you could immediately fall face forward onto the thick orange comforter. The next day, we were tired from weeks of travel. We had already been to Paris, London, Dublin, and Prague, and we spent most days walking, spending money on nothing but street food, beer, and museums. Something felt wrong to me the first day we walked around the city. We tried to understand the underground trains, but we couldn't, and we were sick of talking to one another by then. I had been sneaking off to bathrooms and crying throughout the trip. I had been thinking of leaving your father, but you already know that. I never mentioned his affair, and he pretended not to notice my despair. As he tried to find an English speaker working at the train station, I leaned against a large beam and watched as people walked casually by and through the turnstiles. I heard a man yell in a grovelly, agitated sort of way, and when I looked towards him, I saw a man sitting at his feet who was just as dirty as him, wearing a shirt too small for his large, round body. 
He had thrown up in his lap, and the man standing was yelling at him in what I assumed was Hungarian, kicking the side of his leg and swinging a dark green bottle in the air. I saw the puddle of blood beneath his foot before your father found me and suggested we go. We left the train station without any answers and went to bed early, prepared to rent bicycles the following morning. He asked me what I wanted to do. We were standing outside the makeshift changing room and locker they had given us. It was similar to that of a dressing room at a secondhand store at home, the cheaply constructed door made of painted plywood with a wobbly silver doorknob. The Hungarian boy looked at us. He could have been only 16 or 17. His blonde hair was cut short, most likely for the summer. His blue eyes were large and anxious as he looked away and back at us, his eyes downcast, bowing his head occasionally as he said something in Hungarian, interspersed with very sorry, very sorry, over and over. I smiled at him because I felt sorry that he was the only employee at the baths who knew enough English to communicate with us. The rest of the staff appeared to be middle-aged and female, their hair rough, dull, and brown, the curls bouncing as they said, no, no, shrugging their shoulders or shaking their hands at us as they said, no, no, walking away until one of them, her hair dyed a yellow blonde, finally brought the boy to us. I told your father I didn't know what I wanted to do, whispered it really as I didn't want the boy to see how upset I really was that my bag, carrying my very expensive new camera, had been stolen from the cubbies outside the sauna because I felt guilty and foolish and I couldn't stop thinking about the man sitting in his vomit without any shoes, a puddle of blood beneath his foot. It was not my idea to carry the bag with us through the baths, I wanted to tell the boy. I wasn't the one who was paranoid someone would steal it from the small room with the wobbly silver doorknob. Please don't think I'm another selfish, stupid American, I wanted to tell him. Although, of course I know now that I was. I am. I was wearing only a thin brown bathing suit I bought for very cheap at one of those chain stores we also had back home. It didn't look great on me, although I'm sure now I'd feel differently. Maybe even think I was beautiful with my muscular legs and strong arms. My skin was sun-kissed and my shoulders a little burnt. I remember because they hurt at, ooh, sorry. <laughs> I remember because they hurt, oh man, where'd it go? Oh no, sorry guys. They hurt to the touch, I know that, and that's how the sentence ends. And what's weird is that I looked over this before and it's a different page. Fast forward. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I made people laugh, and I was like very scared about not making people laugh. So I'm glad that made you laugh. Okay. After your father left me at the bathhouse, I stared at the map for a long while and looked out ahead. The park was immense, more beautiful and green than anything we saw our entire time in that city, except for the massive old buildings, each with a history I would never know despite the notes I kept in my journal about what to look up when I got home. I said goodbye to my rented bike as I walked past it. The key was in my bag that got stolen. I still remember your father's back as he pedaled away from me to call home and how I felt lighter once he left. People stared at me as I walked through the park and then onto the city streets. My thighs rubbed together, my wet hair dripped down my neck, shoulders, and arms. It was the first time I didn't care to be seen in my body like that. Or I cared, but I didn't much have a choice. I felt naked, but it was the first time I thought it didn't really matter. I stopped looking at the map and walked wherever I pleased. I tried going into a museum where an American photographer's photos were showing, large Hollywood-style productions, but the guard wouldn't let me in, and I laughed as he walked me out. I grabbed a pair of sunglasses someone left on a bench as I ambled away. When I walked into the bar, I sat down at the stool next to him as if he'd been waiting for me. The place was empty except for the bartender who took little of notice of me walking in. He was too busy reading what looked like the same TV guide I noticed a man in the sauna reading earlier that day, except it wasn't curled from the heat. My thighs stuck to the warm brown leather as I spread my legs open and leaned forward to signal the bartender. I pointed to the drink the man was having next to me, something too dark looking to be legal, a kind of liquor I was unfamiliar with, hoping he would also pay for me. Hello, I said. He nodded without looking at me. I examined his face. He had to have been at least twice my age then. I was only 21, you know. Instantly, I felt a deep sympathy for him because of his face. It was covered in old acne scars, only slightly dulled by dark stubble, 
and shorter length hair that fell partially in his face. I found him attractive in the way one is attracted to cacti. You are compelled to touch it, but you must do so hesitantly and with care. I wanted to touch his pitted face with the palm of my hand. I wanted to feel the heat of him. He turned to me slowly. What? He said. The edges of his eyes were naturally downturned like the sad cat that hid in our barn when I was a child. English? I asked him. No, he said. Really? I said. Yeah, he said. <laughs> I stared at him and he stared at me. He looked to my open legs on the leather stool, then to my bathing suit, and finally my face. What? he said, nodding to my body. Mistake, I said. Mistake? Mistake, he said, nodding slowly, taking a sip of his drink. I lifted my hand towards his face, and he watched me from the corner of his eye. He let me get almost close enough to touch his rough cheek before he grabbed my wrist. His hand was as large as the Amish man's hands who sold me butter and beard wax for your grandfather when I was a child. His thick fingers curled into a fist around my flesh and bone, the cuticles torn, his knuckles chapped. He moved my arm slowly and gently, resting my hand on top of my thigh. Sorry, I said. He shrugged his shoulders and drank. We finished our drinks in silence, and I knew to wait for him to make the next move. I stared into the mirror behind the bar as I drank. It was dark inside the bar, even though it was daytime. Thick red curtains covered the one window next to the entrance. I stared at the shadow of my pale shoulders, my dark hair pulled high on top of my head, still damp from sweat as a few old men stumbled in, I assume still drunk from the night before. I thought of crying right then for no reason other than for feeling alive, with only a dim idea of what had come before this moment and no knowledge of what would come next. I wanted to sit like this forever, looking in this shadowy mirror, not so much to see myself, but to disappear. Now we go, he said suddenly. His voice was quiet. His accent, which I couldn't place, was thick. He pulled a bill from his jean pocket, threw it on the bar, and I followed him outside. Thank you. <laughs> So our third reader of the night is Susanna Swatter. And I should say that Susanna actually asked me earlier this week if she could use the same bio from last semester. I was like, I, yeah, sure, like, if you want to. <laughs> Bet she probably didn't think I was going to tell you guys that. <laughs> but Susanna Swatter would like to tell you about her eighth grade class trip. Unagreeable and angsty and only allowed to travel within a three hour radius, her all-girl class finally landed upon Washington, D.C. No, not even, upon Alexandria, Virginia. Here, Susanna went on a ghost tour and took a picture of a ghost in front of a gravestone. Yes, you might not believe her, but somewhere in Virginia there is proof. I want to see the proof. Pix you know, no, picture it didn't happen. She had the man at CBS make double prints of all her disposable camera pics and she was able to take one of the copies into her diary and give the other to a friend. Who doesn't want a ghost picture? The night after the ghost tour, the girls ventured into the big city to see DC's production of Mamma Mia. After the show, the woman who played Meryl Streep's character, but wasn't Meryl Streep, was seen exiting a bar across the street from where the girls were waiting to board a dinner and dance river cruise. Unbeknownst to them, they would be sharing the boat with another 8th grade class. This one including, but not limited to, boys. <laughs> Want to guess how awkward the girls were? Extremely. They spent most of the ride lurking by the wall and trying to reenact Titanic scenes to the dismay of the crew. Though everyone did rally to dance the electric slide. I don't know if that's the same bio from last time because I didn't, you know, watch the video from last time to double check. Ladies and gentlemen, Susanna Swatter. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's not the exact same, but maybe a similar tone. Um, I also feel like this song is kind of what all of my poems are about. So, um, so I'm going to switch gears. Um, I 
and start with something that is somber and also not my own um, because I just wanted to like, you know, just take you guys on this journey. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're all here together. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of people um, pass away this winter in my life, so this is a poem that I've been reading a lot lately. Um, it's called Radar by Jack Spicer. No one exactly knows exactly how clouds look in the sky or the shape of the mountains below them or the direction in which fish swim. No one exactly knows. The eye is jealous of whatever moves and the heart is too far buried in the sand to tell. They are going on a journey, those deep blue creatures, passing us as if they were sunshine. Look, those fins, those closed eyes, admiring each last drop of the ocean. I crawled into bed with sorrow that night, couldn't touch his fingers, see the splash of the water, the noisy movement of cloud, the push of the humpbacked mountains deep at the sand's edge. Okay, now shifting towards the kin. I'm really just going to read you guys a bunch of poems about nuns. Because, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, I think nuns are really cool and really powerful figures, and I just think groups of women are really important. Um, but that's all I'm going to say. We can talk more later over wine. <laughs> so these first three are from a longer series um, of Book of Hours poems that I've been working on. And this is just going to be like grabbed out of them, so it's not going to make much sense. But okay. Little Office of Our Lady. We wash our hands, a room without windows or rosary. This is the first hour, bleached and wet. We wash our hands in ash. Here is the table under your mother where we pulled you from her. Each bone was a marble in a bag, softened shrapnel in a bird's belly. You chose to chime. At dawn, we ring the bell to make the sky burn crimson. Matin means belonging to the morning. We open. Psalm of Confession. Behold, Mary is a maiden. She lays her palm against her hip and presses down. Once a bone to pop, discolors the, discolors the peace, displaced since birth. Blossoms blue and gold, five prints on her pelvis, one for a season and one that won't turn. In winter she plays our Lucy. She is told to lighten up as she bears them a tray of rolls. Their Lucy was brothled and blinded, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Laments. Mary of plum dumplings, I don't want you. Don't give me your sweet cream and chestnuts. I'll take another taste of unicum to settle my stomach. Mary of small glasses, we did not yet know the shape your wrist makes when you pour. We know, we will forget. Sweat through our skin, the last clean suit. Okay. So the last poem I'm going to read to you is a little bit longer. Um, it's a poem about my hometown, but also about nuns. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we go. Feast days. I trail a branch like a tail to see if something follows. I don't think of him anymore. He's missed the line and now makes a home of clots. Mine is a slow walk. If he's found my path, he'll have forgotten it is mine. Set up camp, let iodine into my water, and dig a hole to shit in. Thanksgiving last, I drive to a convent of nuns who make Gouda the way their mothers learned. The curdled, thinned way, that morning full of salt. I watched boys clump on the curb of frat row, duffel bags stained and stuffed, grease puddled below their folk civics like drool on a pillow. The houses exhaling, left defaced. No, riddled with aluminum, crushed boxwood and sign, half legible. Men of honor, do not. One December, my dad played a formal for a house here, riddled with alums, drunk, wintry men, snow white and rose red. When finished, my dad passed a ring of brothers beating a plastic Santa with a yardstick candy cane, taking turns whacking off paint from Santa's face. My father carried his double bass in one arm, dented Santa in the other. He came home a three-headed silhouette. It is easier to recognize the puncture and plastic. Dad says, am I just lucky then that I don't know any women who were raped, 
thinks one of five is too much, is sure of it. I am sent out to buy cheese for the feast next week. I gather speed, shift gears. The blur of country, plantation homes, hunt clubs, trailer parks wreathed in evergreen, ends at the convent. I take a beat at the wheel, watch the nuns out front in black and white, a mirror of horizon. Come spring, they won't turn green again. Come spring, those boys will demand a concession for their damage to succeed. The, mill, the nuns mill about, the wimples flash like animal hides unprimed. I wonder if they have names they call their daughters, sounds they rolled in their mouths as girls. Alexis, Oksana, pet names now, they do not repent. The dogs trail the sisters through the yard. Sisters do not trip or stop their walk. They sidestep, retract, reach to touch a wet head, to open the door as I pull in. They do not speak or feel to find the other. They do so without looking up. She was fired from a sales job at a preppy men's clothing store. She failed to engage the customers in conversation about their golf handicaps. Later, she dreamed of being a singer-songwriter until her drama teacher told her she was tone deaf. She has, though, spent decades excelling at wandering. From Watertown, Connecticut to Amherst, Massachusetts, from Poughkeepsie, New York to New York City, from Japan to LA, along with Philadelphia, Boston, and Washington, DC, she's lived in them all. Three years ago, she landed in Pittsburgh, where she is still trying to find the beach, me too, <laughs> and a few days in a row of sunshine, me too. Um, Maggie is also a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine and a visiting professor at Pitt. Thank you, Jen. skills in fiction, so everything that I'm reading is true. <laughs> when I was a child, storytelling took place in the basement, in the only room in my house that was ever locked. Inside, the air felt several degrees cooler, and it smelled of talcum powder and stale cigarettes. From floor to ceiling, posters of magicians, most from the turn of the century, lined the walls. The illusionist Alexander wore a feathered turban and glared at me as he held a crystal ball with the caption, The Man Who Knows. Next to him, the magician Kasner stirred a cauldron with a witch's head floating in steam. Nearby, Thurston vanished cars and levitated women, sending one into the sky in a glass elevator. Across the room stood a bookcase, which, if I pushed on it just right, open to a dark storage area. Inside, the shelves were lined with shoe boxes filled with fake thumbs, cigarettes, decks of cards. A black hat and white gloves sat on one shelf. Other shelves had scarves that turned into canes, champagne bottles that opened into cigarette dispensers, silver balls that transformed into bouquets of flowers. The basement centerpiece, though, was the stage. That's where our family performances took place throughout the 60s and 70s. Old. <laughs> um, behind blue curtains sat a large cabinet from which my brothers would appear and then with a few words from my father would disappear. Across the stage, my father would vanish from a velvet chair and then enter through the basement door a few minutes later. The most mesmerizing trick though featured my mother. As the curtains opened, my mother dressed in a long gold brocade gown and black flats lay on a divan. Her eyes were closed, her hands crossed at her chest, 
my father told the audience that he had put her into a trance. <laughs> then slowly, my mother's body rose off the couch and into the air at the command of my father's hands. She stopped. In silence, my mother hovered over the stage. As a child, I relished books that transported, transported me from my suburban world, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Secret Garden, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Baisley, Frank Weiler. But many of the most powerful stories came from my father, who wove magic tales into our family life. Each magic poster they hung in our den, as well as in the basement, had its own narrative, such as the modern priestess of Delphi, which depicted a witch whispering secrets to a long-haired woman who wrote, read people's minds. We heard about magic's tragedies, too, like when the illusionist Chung Ling Su died after his bullet-catching trick went awry. Best of all, my father invited his children into magic secrets. Long, not long after we learned to walk, we knew how to sidestep the trapdoor in the stage floor. By elementary school, I understood how most of my father's illusions worked. I never told a soul. Don't even ask. <laughs> my father spent much of his youth at vaudeville shows and at Tannen's Magic Store on 42nd Street in New York, where he bought tricks and picked up tips from the profession's elders. Then, when he was in his 30s, after years of practicing magic on the side, he took a sabbatical from his law firm. He bet a fellow lawyer $100 that he would land a spot on a major TV show or at a New York City nightclub within a year. Whoever lost had to eat the paper their bet was written on. <laughs> it was 1959, the era of black tie magic. Under the stage name Baron Laval, and with an act he called Smoke Dreams, my father incidentally did not smoke despite all the references to cigarettes in this piece. Um, my father appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. How many of you even know what that is? Okay. In a tux and black dress hat, he smoked cigarettes and pulled cards out of the air. He made live goldfish appear out of his puffs of cigarette smoke. He produced gloves. He produced doves from his white gloved hand. Next, my father performed on Captain Kangaroo and his manager offered him a national tour. But he had a wife, three kids, and three more to come in the next several years. My father returned home, and magic was reserved for the basement and for our family. Over the next two decades, the magic act was an intermission to my parents' parties. On summer evenings, our house filled with smoke from Marlboro's that my mother placed in silver boxes and the sound of adult laughter loosened by gin and tonics. It was usually around 11 p.m. when my mother, smelling a Jean Coutu perfume and bourbon, long earrings sparkling against her black hair, nudged us awake. It's time, Angel. My brother was three and I was five, too young to be relied on for impeccable performance timing. Still, we tiptoed downstairs, following my mother past the women in the living room in their cocktail dresses and frosted pink lipstick, and men in sports jackets and loafers around the corner and down the stairs to the basement where my father had set up the show. Stephen and I climbed into our secret spot and listened as the guests, laughing too loudly, flirting, their cocktail glasses still clinking with ice, filled the seats. I no longer remember the details of the story that went with my brothers and my trick, except that it entailed missing jewels from a large leather trunk. My father tilted the trunk toward the audience, knocking on all four sides to show that it was empty. Moments later, he opened the top of the trunk again and pulled out his jewels. My brother and me, dressed in our hooded pajamas, <laughs> to the applause of the adults. Several years later, I, gra I graduated to a role I coveted. For years, it had been my big sister's, but she was now away at college, and it was mine. <laughs> I relished that the trip was just me and my father. The prop was a large, empty glass case casket on wheels in the middle of the room. The story had a fairy book quality. A king's daughter, the princess, was lost. The king offered all of his gold to anyone who could find her. At that point in the performance, my, my father covered the empty casket in a gold cloth to symbolize the king's wealth. As my father wheeled the casket around the room, he told of the king's anguish and of, young, and of a, young prince's, a young prince's determination to scour the countryside to find the girl. Then, with a flick of his wrist, my father pulled off the cloth. There I was, 
reclining me in the glass casket, an adolescent anti-princess, barefoot, long hair barely combed, and cut-off jean shorts and an Indian print t-shirt. At that age, I often stayed to watch the rest of the show. I had seen it all before, but now I watched it through a different lens than when I was younger. For my entire childhood, my father had descended into the basement after dinner and on Saturday afternoons, rehearsing his act for hours upon hours. On occasion, he asked me to be his critic as he tested a trick. I knew up close how much he relied on timing, on the dance of his skilled hands, to take his audience attention where he wanted it to go. By the time of the performances, he made it seem so simple, so seamless. But early on, I had learned that beautiful narratives rarely come that easily. Mm -hmm.